Okay, so through the power of the internet, um, I, uh, Fuzzy Group, I've asked you to speak. I don't know, not actually know. Fuzzy Group, I don't know what you prefer to be called. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, this was, I, I don't know anyone's name, so anyway. Um, so, I, Adam, I really liked our, uh, the, the episode we did. When did, did you happen to know when that was? Did you look that up? I, I looked it up. It was in September. Did it feel like it was in September? Uh, I don't know whether it felt like it was 25 minutes ago or 25 years ago, but, but um, definitely no, one of those two. Like right? Yeah, right. Exactly. exactly yeah, right. Yeah. Right. yeah I, I feel like time has been so wildly distorted. That feels both very recent and a very, very, very long time ago. Um, but that, like, we came into that basically without a plan <laughs> and it ended up being, I really enjoyed that. That was a, that was a fun conversation. Totally. It felt like a big stage dive and all the folks caught us and I'm really hoping they catch us again. <laughs> exactly. So on that note, get ready to catch us, everybody. Um, and I, I can, I bet, uh, I'm going to try, if I was going to try to make you, uh, oh, if you are on, note that if you are on the desktop, you can't speak. You actually need to be on the mobile app. We really, Twitter Spaces needs to somehow make this very clear to people that you cannot contribute to a Twitter space from the desktop app. It's really kind of criminal. Um, so, Adam, did you read any of the books coming out of that? Did you get any books coming out of that? Did you read any? What were what were some of the highlights from the from the last time we did this? Oh, jeepers! Now, now I'm on the spot. I saw when it was, but I, I didn't look into the details. I uh, I don't know which one. Oh, I, I don't know if the deck book was on the list. Maybe that was a more no, 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 it was on the list. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Then yes, then yes. Uh, deck deck is dead. Long live deck. I got from that space. <laughs> uh, let the record You know, show. I like I wasn't assessing you. It's like it would have been fine if you hadn't. I was more just I oh, but what a relief. Um you are, however, reading a book that I don't think we talked about at that last episode that I thought I wonder if you might kick us off on. The uh, are we talking about the beautiful C plus plus book? Uh, you know, I out of out of respect for your own privacy, I was not gonna bring that up, but now now we're here. Oh. So let's talk about yeah, let's talk about beautiful C plus plus. Is it an oxymoron? Okay. It, no, no, no. It's I mean it's I guess it is beautiful to some. So this <laughs> is, uh, I, uh, so um, my older son got interested in C++. Um, I, my, my colleagues have been very patient with me about this, like not, not call, calling child protective services or whatever. Uh, they said, why, you know, why not C Sharp? Why not Rust? And I said, because he wants C++ and I can't talk him out of it. So he got a pile of books. And, and I think I, we also I told you that it is normal for teenagers to be pushing boundaries, to be doing things that That's are... Right. That, that that exercise a lack of judgment like this is normal for a teenager so this, is a, this is a very <laughs> normal right. teenage development and, 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 and experimentation right. with c plus plus i mean you want him to do it safely you <laughs> that's right so, so that that's why i got him beautiful c plus plus because if he was going to do it I, I, I wanted him to do it safely it, safe it is time like, it occurred to me that you're already we is uh 16 17 and we haven't we, we haven't had the conversation about memory safety and that that's right. <laughs> that's right. Look, I just I just want you to be memory. Safe. I just want that's you to be all, memory safe. That's that's all, that's all I want, and I just you know it, it's it's not always going to happen, but just I just don't want there to be lasting consequences. You know, it's um, and how is he taken to that? How did he did he take the beautiful C plus plus? Well, so he has not read beautiful C plus plus. He's he's getting the meat and potato C plus plus first, and I because are in part because I promptly <laughs> stole beautiful C plus plus, but uh, I, I stole it because the the last time I did. C, any kind of C++ programming was uh, in the late 90s. Like, no joke, like 1998, ni maybe 1999 was the last time I did any C++ program of, of note, of any note. And so if he was going to ask me stuff, I didn't want to show him kind of this, you know, mostly C, like C with classes, basically. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be such a Luddite. So I want to- I you trying to, try to like talk like the teenagers now? Are you going to be- Yeah, yeah, I wanted I, to be hip. I wanted to be I, hip. I, yeah, I wanted to be lit af. Am I using that correctly? <laughs> I, so no, you're giving me you a strange look. I shouldn't say that. I mean, have you looked at modern C++? Yeah, it's called Rust. I mean, it's like, it, why would you spend time no, on modern no, C++? No, 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 I know. I, that's, that's, I mean, that is the punchline, but yes, but... Uh, it's like, very so, different. You know, it's super, super different. You, you can't just cast like a cave no. person, right? You have to like dynamic cast or, or unique cast or all, all of these different things. So uh, so I've been, 
I've been trying to absorb C++ um, so that, you know, we can, we can be conversant about it. But seriously, every page of it strikes me not as beautiful, but as disgusting and as basically an advertisement for Rust. Like, yeah, C++ got all these things wrong. All of the defaults, you know, made, made sense in the, the, in the Jurassic era. But now here we are. And so the defaults don't need to all be wrong. The defaults can all be right. And it is called Rust. But it has definitely given me an appreciation for programming languages generally uh, and for Rust specifically as a reaction to some of the shortcomings of C++. So like you tried to go to, like you tried to go to a concert with him to really appreciate his music. <laughs> and you're like, honestly, right. this is just giving me that much more appreciation. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, for the classics. Yeah. Um, and That's how right. does he, how's he reacting to this, the, to, to your, or, 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 or is this oh. all, keep, are you keeping this to yourself? I keep this okay. to myself. I, I speak what I speak when spoken to. You're a very um, good father. I mean, you're just like, well, well, I just mean, I mean, he, he won't listen to me. Just to, Well, just you're very pragmatic. Really That's what makes you a good father. But, exactly. You got to be pragmatic. But, but, you know, when he was like, hey, uh, how does this virtual memory stuff work anyway? I, you know, I was like, oh, okay, well, can I see the keyboard for a second? And was able to show him that like, you know, pointers were numbers. And I, oh, you man. know, That's I did so use, I, I, I got immediately into pointer unsafety, but, uh, but yeah, it was pretty neat. And so, so now when he shows me C++ that he's written, I can at least understand it because, you know, I under, because I, I am, I am beautiful C++ ified. I, I, I feel like you are at the, what's the fatherhood institute from the Simpsons? I feel like I'm, I... <laughs> <laughs> it does, don't get me wrong. Like it feels like a huge win. And I, I mentioned to this to you the other day, I went to his room and found like a book uh, called uh, systems programming. And I was like, I, I don't know how this happened, but I feel like everything has gone. Oh right. man. That's really great. That's the, no, it's, it's I, great that they've got such interest. And, and then I think also like good on you for kind of trying to encourage that interest without actually squelching it. Because I think you could easily do that with either over, over oh. enthusiasm, or you could just be like in this house under this roof, we use memory safe languages. <laughs> as long as I am paying the mortgage, young man. That's, that's right. No, uh, I, I've definitely squelched other things in the past. That's so right. uh, it's, it's all just learning uh, from my own mistakes. Uh, on that one. I told, and, and how um, are you? So, Beautiful C++ is to you is just like, this is why we should have Rust. Like, this is not. It's, I mean, it, it is, it is a, I, I'd actually recommend it. Like, I, I think it's an interesting book. <laughs> are no, no, are I, they going to put I, that on the back jacket? I'd, I'd, I'd yeah. actually recommend it. Raves, Adam Evans. Well, I, I, di I did, I do want to like see if I can get, so the, the authors are Guy Davidson and Kate Gregory. And I would be very interested to see, and I, I've looked all over to see if they acknowledge Rust. And the closest I could find on Twitter was Guy Davidson saying, I don't really have time to try new languages, which, <laughs> which is such a shame. Yeah, yeah that's because yeah. these are these are folks who who really have nuanced, deep thinking on on this, you know, very important language. This is not the disparity C++, but one that they, they are themselves ready to acknowledge the burrs and the mistakes of. And, um, you know, I'd love to see what they think of Rust, just because I feel like seriously, like every page is just more and more of an advertisement for it. And when, when you get into like concepts, like concept, it, concept is a concept in C++. Whoa. And yes, I had not heard. What, there's concepts. a thing called concepts? There's a thing called concepts okay. that is a, a bit like a trait. Okay. But people are going to like be pilloried for, for, for making that kind of uh, like gross an, uh, analogy there. But it, it you know, it's, um, it's for describing the characteristics of a template. You know, the the type T needs to obey these these parameters. Huh? Yeah, exactly. That's how I felt. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Is that Dan? Are you gone? No. Dan, was that okay. me or is that Adam? That was. Uh oh. What was what, what, what you, Brian? Uh oh. Brian. I think Brian is having some technical oh, difficulties. Okay, it's maybe. me. It's me. It's me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me uh, let me see if I can find my technical difficulties. Okay. Okay. Anyway, uh, beautiful C++ was interesting. Uh, you know, I think maybe just from like a how the other side is is living. Um, yes, sir. But and, and then I did. You know, there is some general like th these are experienced programmers, and I think it's hard to walk away without both. 
learning something from an experienced programmer and finding some point of disagreement with an experienced programmer. Uh, and I did both of those. I things. think it's a shame that they're saying they don't have time to learn a new language, though, because that's obviously wrong. I mean, that, that, that's like you can say, like, I'm just too deep in with C++ to learn a new language. I'm like, I'm, t- I'm too afraid to learn a new language, which is understandable. But it's like, come on, yeah. you, you got time. Like, come up with a different, use a different excuse. Um, yeah. Cobalt people have been saying that for 50 years. You know? <laughs> there you go. Um, okay, so but we, and, uh, did you check out this list that uh, the Fuzzy Group is here? I hear- yeah. Oh, yes, here. I'm here. Um, and, it, and, and, and uh, do we just call you Mr. And, Fuzzy, or is that your father's name? No, no. Fuzzy group just means me and my cats. My, my first name's actually All right, Scott. Cat. There you go. Um, so, Scott, I, I... And Brian's gone. Or I'm gone. No, Brian. no, no, no. no, no. Uh, or we're all gone. gone. No, 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 no. Am uh, I back now? Yes. Okay, God, that was painful because I was actually awake that time. I could hear you saying that I was gone. <laughs> um, I, with Twitter Spaces, you never know who to blame. I, that, this one I'm going to blame on local connectivity for the moment. Um, but so, um, Scott, your th- that list was is is monstrous, and it yes. it almost gave me a little bit of a fight or flight reaction because anytime I'm like, <laughs> I have thought on a book that's not on it. I would look, I'm like, oh my God, how does, so in particular, I will tell you the book that broke me where I'm just like, okay. I have nothing to contribute to this list. Once upon, what, what book once upon a time in computer land. Oh yeah. Bill Miller. I, yeah. Or Mil- Millard, yeah, yeah. The, I, the, I have never, cause I don't think Adam, you and I have never talked about this book. This is an obscure ass book that as far as I was concerned, I was the only person on the planet that had read. And I'm like, this this is like the, the the mics are hot. This is like the Facebook you know Facebook mics are on. This person is in my room right now looking at my bookshelf, <laughs> and I have nothing to contribute. Since then, I have scoured my bookshelf, and I do have some things to contribute. But and I don't mean to sound make, it's it's clearly not a contest, even though I'm obviously crazy that way. No, um, but very very impressed by the scope of of books that you've read because you also you've read these things. You've actually um, so I. I I All right, so I just want to add, because clearly you've been doing this for a long time. You've got, obviously, yep. you're a kindred spirit in that, like, you find yep. this stuff really interesting. Why have you, I mean, reading has been a really important part, and reading about the history of the industry has been a really, really important part for you. Why is that? What, what have you kind of, what, what has that brought you? Um, I started in the business at 19 when I dropped out of college to found a software company. And I realized I knew Jack. Um, and so I did what, you know, school teaches you to do. I read yeah, it's been- and I read everything I could find. And because I've always been a book nut, I mean, I'm in a room which probably has a couple of thousand books in wow. it right now. Um, you know, like my, my, the bookcase I just put together is probably four feet taller than I am. <laughs> um, wow. I just, I read, right. It's, it's what I do. And like, I've been, you know, and I read ridiculously fast and I retain an awful lot of what I, what I know or what I read and what I, what I found with these kinds of books, and I meant to write this up today and I just got, I went, I fell down a cold, cold hole, hole is these books, all you have to do to justify one of these books is learn one damn thing. From yeah, them, it's great. Right. And like I, I looked at what you said about deck is you know deck is dead long live deck as a as not a great book, and I actually thought it was a pretty good hmm. book because it was a highly academic treatise, and the most interesting thing to me was Gordon Bell Gordon Bell's opinion, yes uh, yeah, yeah yeah where he got yeah. where he got so much wrong yes. and so much wrong oh interesting you think that Gordon Bell also got a lot wrong there mm, interesting yeah, yeah yeah absolutely. He, he, he thought introducing three lines of PCs at the same time was the right thing <laughs> right. to do. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, and Gordon Bell is a brilliant man to this day. Gordon Bell is brilliant. Do you have – so a book that – I will also say this. I have books that are not on your list that I'm not necessarily proud of because they're not very good and they don't belong on your list. But <laughs> – so I ended up buying his high-tech ventures. I think I mentioned this last time. And that is not that, – that, that's a bit of a stinker. That one is not good. Um, it, it, all it takes 
need to just like I look at I look at high tech case studies like like I look at cookbooks. One good recipe from a cookbook just yeah, I have that. that's a very good approach. Yeah, look, learning one thing from one of these books, and you will always learn one thing. Even when they are comically bad, I feel that they are. So one book that you've got on there that is definitely – I don't think it's a book that I've regretted reading, even though it is absolutely terrible, is almost perfect. About word perfect. Yep. <laughs> uh, well, actually, you see, and even there, I would disagree because you look at that book, and one of the things that we all forget about word perfect is that they built that company on a culture of support. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, t- I totally, I agree. I, that's why I haven't, I don't, do, Adam, did you read this? Almost Perfect? No. Oh, God, this guy, I mean, on the one, like, it is an interesting book. It's a, this guy wrote it as a memoir. He is a total jackass. And, and it's like, you go into the book being like, oh, this is interesting. Like, this is a person who built well Perfect. And it's one of these, like, slowly dawning things of like, I think this person might be a jackass. And then as soon as, like, the light goes on of like, oh, my God, this person is a jackass, then it just, it the whole thing on spools, but you're making a very good point, Scott, about the cultural Yeah, it, it, it and it was, and that was one of the that was the key differentiator from Word Perfect back in mm, the day. Yeah, right. Is that support was a way to build a relationship with your customers and a way to get to get customers, right? Because we were at that time, support was a paid thing. Um, and I, I thought it was a really interesting. It was a really interesting model. And WordPerfect was actually a hell of a text editor back then. W- Amen. WordPerfect four dot one. Amen. Four dot two. Four dot two. Yeah, I guess you know. I I I, I think I was. I and all right. So how many? When well, no, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do the number of key combinations you can do with WordPerfect. That's, 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 that's <laughs> not necessary, and it would make Adam. Adam would just feel. I, Adam, you never use WordPerfect, right? Uh, I definitely use Word Did Perfect. Okay. I use Word Perfect on my PowerBook 100 because in the four megabytes of memory, I could fit like Word Perfect and like two other programs. Nice. Yeah, but you could have used you could have used Nesis for 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 a better editing experience. Mm, I also I also like paid for BB Edit back in the day. So excellent and still and still actually around. That's right. Amazing way, defying physics, saving way. So, and I loved your annotated list. Um, uh, there are a bunch of books on there that um, certainly I have loved that, that you also, I, you love the Friendly Orange Glow. We talked about that a bunch. Um, oh my gosh. That was, that was probably, probably my, my new favorite, favorite. Like it's just so good. Yeah. And it's like, these books are different because you got like kind of different categories. That book is like a labor of love by someone who, I mean, Brian Deere clearly, what you know came up with Plato, loves it, and is trying to tell its story. Then you get the kind of I actually also love the books. I mean, just kind of going through the books that I that I think are really stick out. The books written by reporters are the re- always, always good. good. The reportage is always good. And I mean, I I, I mean, I, I love the ultimate entrepreneur. We talked about that last one. That was terrific. Um, I, um, I, I mean, I think we, the, I also noticed that you had Randall Strauss's a couple books that I've not, I was unaware of that he'd written. We, I, we've talked about Steve Jobs and the next big thing a lot, but he's written a bunch more. Uh oh. Is this me? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. No, no, sorry, it's, no, 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 that's, um, the, and, but there were, he, you had a couple of books that he'd written that I now want to go read. I kind of want to go read everything he's written because I, I, I so enjoyed Steve Jobs and the next big thing. He's a good writer. He's a good writer. And it, 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 it's like well-researched stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So um, yeah. So the, 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 what's your kind of been, what's been your recent t- kick on? Oh, and actually I, I, you also have, you have a soul of a new machine story. I understand. Yeah. So this is a great story, and I'll give you the I'll give you the headline, and you can tell me if you want me to tell it, because um, it is a bit it is a bit long, but it's a good it's a good war story. Go. All right. So so you remember? Ugh, good. Sorry about that. Um, am, I, am I still alive? You are still alive. Okay. So. Soul of a New Machine. It's the tale of a cocky set of uh, it's a tale of a cocky upstart company with two teams competing. The blessed team in North Carolina, codenamed Fountainhead, and the scrappy team of upstarts who shouldn't actually succeed, but of course ultimately do because it's a good story. I bear the unique um, imprint of 
I was fired by by the leader of Fountainhead. And oh, interesting. And to make matters worse, it cost me about three quarters of a million dollars. Oh, man. Whoa. So. Whoa. So. Okay. Do you, Go on. All right. So I, I ran a small software company from 87 to 96. Um, I founded it. We made hypertext tools four years before TBL announced the World Wide Web. Yeah, right. This is like early, 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 early days yep. of hypertext. Yeah. And we were finally bought out in 1996 to be a publicly traded company's internet strategy. We were going to be the low end internet <laughs> strategy. Okay. And this company was called Dataware and we were at a, at a Cambridge mass. My third day on the job and mind you, I'd been, you know, running my own show for nine years. I was just, I was told that the project was canceled and I was left wondering, does that mean they're going to try and return us? Right. Welcome to it, welcome to corporate America and strategy changes. Uh, uh, totally. Right. And did you have? Uh, so did you have an earnout, or how was the deal structured? Uh, yeah. I had an awful lot of stock options. I ended up after okay. after a repricing, I ended up with about seventy two thousand, seventy five thousand stock options. That number be in the parent in, company. In the parent in, company. In, and, 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 and that okay. becomes relevant. And there was cash, et cetera, but but most of the, right, a lot right. of the value was in stock. So okay. I went okay. from a product manager of a new product that was going to be based on our technology to literally nothing. And I was just given random projects by management to pitch a, a new market to tackle. So my first project was to, quote, evaluate the company's internet strategy. Now, this came from the founder, chairman, and CEO, whose name was Kurt. And he told, and like, he asked me to do this. And I figured, that's what you do, right? So I, I did this, and my report perhaps was a bit indelicate. It might have used the word brain dead. Um, and <laughs> I mean, it was. <laughs> it, it was. Like, it tied the company to a proprietary build of Netscape Navigator tied to a CD-ROM. Like, it was bad. Okay, so and th this is just to set the stage. This yeah. is 1996 and the internet. Yep. And I do feel that not to take us to crypto, but I think I'm going to do that a little bit right now. The because I think like th there's been this idea that of revisiting this period of time and being like, oh, people didn't think the internet was going to do anything. And to okay. the contrary, I would say no, 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 no. Like people really realized how important the internet was. This was it was, and so you. What, what was much more common is that for organizations to not. Pr they weren't dismissing the internet. They just didn't understand it. And it's how, what was the category that you were in? Uh, I understood it. Oh, sure. Right? Yeah, no, I know. Like, you also understood it. it. The company did not. Right, um, and, right. and despite the fact that the only application you ever saw on an executive's machine was a browser, like they completely didn't get it. And huh. so, all right. So what, so what happened is I wrote this report. And I, you know, I was, we, we were a small company. We were all in the same damn close, you know. I hadn't grown up with email. Like the last email I'd used had been on, on a. Um, hey, Scott, you're, you're kind of breaking up. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if it's just me or. Sperm. So, and hey Scott, I, I think you're breaking up a bit. I'm not sure if it's a headset issue or um, I, uh, but I think you think you've, you, you, we, we only got, I would say, every fifth syllable in that. Oh, oh crap. Um, so the founder took the report I wrote and sent it around the company via email. Are you okay? Any, any better? It, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's good. All right. So the okay. indelicate report has been sent around via email. And I had no idea that the strategy I criticized was made by the most powerful executive at the company. Uh. <laughs> and uh, he hated me. So this led to me becoming a Monday morning management football where the topic of the meeting was often, what the hell has Scott done lately? <laughs> That's fun. What a fun executive staff. Yes. So three and a half years go by and or two and a half years, three and a half years, whatever the hell it was. So you, you grind it out there. Yep. 
And wow. I built I built a team. We shipped a product. We were in Gartner's Magic Quadrant, like whole nine yards, big enterprise stuff. We were doing corporate you, knowledge management stuff. You were in the right part of the Magic Quadrant because I've been in the yes. wrong part of the Magic Quadrant. Before. I was That's in the right part. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Now, Dataware as a company was a great tech company with zero marketing skills, right? Hmm. Okay. Their approach to selling sushi would have been to call it cold dead fish. It, okay, I so kid, I kid I, you not. I have heard the, uh, this. Uh, who? What company did you originally hear that aphorism applied to? I cannot remember. Like I know I've heard it enough, and I just I haven't. I can't remember. Because it, 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 it was it was relayed to me is as they say of HP. So I'm sure it's been said before many companies. But anyway, okay. Yeah, so yes, I, I, I think that I think that's right. Right. Yes. Yeah, so, cold dead fish. That's sushi. Yep. So, lo and behold. Um, the founder, Kurt, guy who bought me, had originally founded this company in Germany. He brought it to the States to get, to get venture because he can't raise venture, venture in Europe. And when he did this a decade ago, he had made a promise to his wife that, Helga, we can go home someday. And she finally called that card. She finally played that card. And then Kurt made the worst possible hiring mistake you can make for executive staff. Huh. He hired rich, not hungry. So okay. what happened? Ooh, so what do you mean? What do you mean hiring rich, not hungry? Oh, it's just like, okay, I think I know what you mean, but, it, but explain. He hired someone who had made his nut. Yeah. Right? So, and, and this, is, this is relevant because the person he hired was the former leader of Fountainhead. Okay. This is where this guy comes into the story. This is where this guy comes into the story. So we, we bought a small company, and it was one of those deals where the small company ends up, ends up owning us. <laughs> and running right. us. All right. right. So, the old who acquired whom. Yep. And there's there's a couple of actually good lessons here for Oxide, which is one of the reasons why I kind of wanted to tell the story. Uh-oh. Um, so what, what Kurt did was he looked, you know, rather than hiring somebody, you know, young and from Oracle, he went to somebody he could look up to, like feel good about turning his company over to. Okay. And at the time, we were a publicly traded entity. We were profitable, about $45 million in revenue. Um, and so the first thing that happens when you, you, when two tech companies come together is you do an offsite and you put the tech leads in one room quote, so they can figure out how to have the best of both architectures, because we all know that that always works, right? That's, that's, what's going to happen. What's going to come out of that room is the best of both architectures. Yeah. yeah. Why? No, come on, Scott. It's, that's it right there on the agenda item. Like, yep. come on. So we, we all, all the tech leads get sent out to Amherst, Massachusetts, which was the little company's headquarters. And I did what my mom taught me to do. When... Uh-oh. We just lost I, I, yeah, I, his mother's life. I, I think his mother told him to bring a six-year to the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so so w- what my mom taught me about school was you sit up front, you ask questions, and you pay attention. Right? It's really simple. So that, That's actually good advice. So, That's good advice. You know, Adam's, Adam is a good father. Your mom's a good mother. That's good advice. My mom's a good mother. So I did this for three days. OK. And, you know, we, we bonded with the team, et cetera, et cetera. So three days of this. And I finally after three days off setting, I finally get to go home. I go home. And I mean, this was the day of days of voicemail. And, and we didn't have any remote access. So you had to go into the office to check it. And I was notorious for never checking my voicemail anyway. I happened to decide to go into the office that Friday night and check it. And I have a message waiting for me that, te- that is, tells me in the most awkward and, and impolite fashion that it has been decided that my services are no longer required. <laughs> it decided. Passive voice. Passive oh, voice. On voicemail? <laughs> Passive voice, voice on the voicemail. Oh, my God. And, oh my God. But, and I can almost quote the voicemail to this day. Um, and that I. Oh, we lost you again. I want it out loud, reading the voicemail. All right, go. Are you there? So the, vo- the voicemail goes something like this. Uh, Scott, this is um, Charlie, <laughs> Charlie Rabby, your boss. It's, it's been decided that we don't need your services anymore. <laughs> and you need to show up at corporate headquarters on Monday to negotiate your severance package. Thanks. Okay. Okay, well, that's something. <laughs> that's like, it was cl- it you know, was clearly intended to blindside me in the worst manner possible. 
right? Just the worst manner possible. And so I did. And I went for... Was the, yeah, this must have, this company must have been... Wait, what happened to the company? The company must have oh, been acquired. Oh, there, there's, a, there's a postscript here. <laughs> okay. Right, there has oh, to be. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I went from being a very, very prominent, very visible... Um, executive to completely vanishing. Okay. Right. And they were very adamant that I not talk to anyone. I was, mm. I was declared persona non grata. So there's a couple of, there's a couple of lessons here. So the first thing that it took me a, a several years to understand is that um, the leader of Fountainhead, whose name was Dave Mahoney and Dave Mahoney had for, had gone from being the leader of Fountainhead and Data General to being the head of Banyan Vines. I don't know if you remember the Vines network product. Yeah, right. right. Yes. Always had the best technology and the worst marketing. Hmm. Right. Dave Mahoney right. is also from the cold dead fish school of sushi marketing. So when you have when you when you don't do something well, don't then buy, don't then take on leadership that also does the same thing poorly. Um yeah, and, and so I, what I came to understand is that Dave Mahoney was simply clearing the decks. I was a management distraction and he got rid of it. And he made a, he made a friend in, in the powerful executive, right? So that was smart. Um, and what Dave Mahoney did was he took a publicly traded $45 million company and in three years ran it out of business. Where? Okay, so I'm dying to know where the three quarters of a million dollars came from. So uh, where, I had, was sitting, so over the course of the next year to 18 months, Dave did manage to get a pretty substantial run up in the stock price. Oh, and so okay. I so you, could have returned, could have turned, you know, 10 to $12 a share, and I would right. have dumped if, those shares. <laughs> oh, okay, there you go. Right. Yeah, if you know that you would have dumped yep. them. So, I, and in the, fi in the there's a, a couple of final laughs. So they never explained why I left. And after I, le after I left, they had a bunch of other senior departures. And I never knew why. I ended up running to the guys in a, in a bar in Boston a few years later. And what they told me was they never explained why you left. You sat in the meetings. You were the only one who asked good questions. Actually, you're the only one who asked questions at all. And when you disappeared, we figured that you decided that the strategy couldn't possibly work, hmm. right? So when you have departures, you explain them because people will come up with their own reasons. That is absolutely, um, absolutely. Well, I, I also feel that like people should be explaining in their own words why I, they're, I, they're leaving. I think they should, but when you have, when you do dismissals poorly, and they did this one very, very poorly, you're always scared of what they're going to say. And and I had yeah. I had a whole I had a team of twenty five engineers that were very that were very dedicated, right? Because right. I take care of right. engineers because they are my damn people, right? Um, and so Dave Mahoney failed upwards as he has his whole career, and he went on to run something <laughs> else into the ground, I believe. Um, I don't quote me on that; I might be wrong. Um, and that executive who who lambasted me, I outlived him. Oh, there! It, there uh, that, that got dark. <laughs> the ultimate revenge. The ultimate, the ultimate revenge. revenge. Exactly. Right. Um, he, apo he, right, he apologized. So but, but he ultimately he apologized. But I outlived him. So the finest. So, I, I, so because I definitely noticed that a, a theme in your bookshelf was the kind of swashbuckling corporate tales. Yep. And he, I mean, I think anyone sees something of themselves in some of these tales, but you must see a lot of your, I mean, you must, I mean, in, in particular, the, the incident that you're referring to in Solvent and Machine, yep. where they best Fountainhead yep. is referred to in a way that did not strike me at all on my original read when I was like 18 or 19, but definitely struck me on the reread when I was, you know, in my forties, which is, they called it the big shootout at Hojo's. Yep. And I, which is just so, I, I feel it's such a good, I mean, it's so visceral. I feel like, you know, first of all, it's a Hojo's, which is like Adam. I mean, you know what a Hojo's is, but like this is not a this is a reference that will lose currency in our. <laughs> it feels like it's pretty gone, but yes, you're right. So and so a Hojo's is like not it basically like this is a shootout at Motel Six. Like the, there's a conference room that they have at a Hojo's. It's a very 
kind of like a down market conference room that ends up being the site of massive corporate violence as, as these two groups duel one another. I, anyway, I thought it was a very visceral description. And I, I, I do love that in these memoirs where the talking about this kind of organizational strife and I feel they are very educational in terms of how to do things and how, especially how not to do things. Mm-hmm. Uh, where, and I think one thing that I have found, and Adam, I don't know if you found this as well, but like where we have done things that have been that have felt idiosyncratic or unusual, and you know, I mean, not, not like we've got don't have confidence in it, but it's always like I don't think anyone else has done it this way. It is always really interesting to find another entity in history that like, oh wait, wait a minute, they did it exactly this way. And I feel like this, and this happened with us on actually one of the kind of the first gifts of Twitter Spaces was I think in one of our early ones, someone pointed out that hey, do you know that Next did the same thing that you guys are doing in terms of compensation? And they're like, are you kidding me? And it was really, really interesting to read that bit yep. from Steve Jobs' and big thing. Um, so I find it like I love reading history for that reason, and to and, and to learn like some of the true stories. This thing I noticed when um, the you got the story of Dean Kamen and the the segue on yes. there. Yes, and I, you you've got to read that, Adam. You would love that book. What, what's that called again? That is called. I've got that over here somewhere. What is? Um, that is reinventing the wheel. It was published under a different title. It was. Uh, it was originally published as Codename Ginger. Not a great title. Um, <laughs> the but reinventing the wheel, I thought was really good. And uh, Scott, you'd read that one as well. Um, oh yeah, with, yeah. What was your boy? Do I not want to work with Dean Kamen? I, I, not- I read that in real time when it came out. Um, oh, did you really? It's oh funny. yeah, yeah. Like because I was fascinated by the tale, and Dean Kamen, like he's I was in Boston at the time, and you know he's got a rep, right? Um, you know, and he he fills that iconoclastic New England home taught engineer sort of vibe. Right. Um, yes. You know, and, and like, and I, I started out as a mechanical engineer, um, you know, so like I, 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 I really liked that and I wanted it to be real. And when I found out it was a mall cop scooter, it's kind of disappointing. <laughs> yeah. So Adam, this book is so good because it also walks through the, uh, this is part of what inspired our, I can't remember if it inspired our hype episode or if our hype episode inspired it, but we, they, they, they built this outlandish hype around it. And the book kind of takes you through all of that. But I actually kind of like, I, w- the thing that was more surprising to me was how poorly it was run from an organizational point of view. It was run, I mean, really an unpleasant person to work for. And it's interesting that he's got that reputation locally in New England. I don't, I don't think, I, it was definitely news to me. I'm like, wow, this guy's really, really, really difficult to work for. Um, and the book is very vivid. Um, but Adam, that one, you, you will really like that book a lot. Uh, on the list, I'm looking forward to it. It's a, it's, a, it's a good read. And it's interesting because it's not, such a high tech tale, like it's an entrepreneurial tale, but not the same kind. Yeah, and I noticed that you had a bunch of those, um, which did did lead me to a, a book that wasn't on your list, but then you added it because I suggested it, and so I was like undermining myself. <laughs> but the but the uh, and you have not yet read Creative Capital on George Dorio. I take no, it. I have not yet. That's, I, I love that it's in my book. It's in my bookcase, but I have not gotten there. And and but the interesting thing about him is he really only had one big success. Well, read the book. Okay. He is a he is an incredibly interesting person, and I haven't felt this mesmerized by a person when reading a book since reading about Alexander Hamilton. Reading Hamilton by oh, Chandler. okay. Well, that that's he. A, that's he a, is like an Alexander Hamilton adventure capital. This guy is amazing, and he is a total polymath. He has got the he plays this kind of like really important role in the logistics of World War II. Yep. And is just a really fascinating guy. And when I say that I haven't felt this way, so I felt this way with two people, the Chernaus Hamilton and and now Creative Capital on George Dorio. Interesting. Where where I no, so I'll tell you the specific feeling I had when reading because Adam, I, I swear like you were next to me when I was doing when I was reading uh the, the Chernaus Hamilton. And I remember reading about a particular episode, I think about, how, about Hamilton squashing the Whiskey Rebellion and thinking to myself, this person is so fascinating. I need to go read a biography on this person. Yep. And another part of my brain is like, jackass, 
you are reading a biography. You you are reading an 800 page biography <laughs> what, what, right what do you, now. What do you think these last five well, pages are going to be? <laughs> like, what, where, where have you been, you fucking idiot? You are reading a biography this morning. But it's like, this is where you have he, because I think Hamilton and again, God bless Chernow and, and Lynn Manuel Miranda for bringing Hamilton, I think, back because yeah. he's such he's such an incredible polymath and there's so much there. And the and I feel the same way about Dorio. I think is it, 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 this is a it's a shorter biography, but I had the same thing. Like I've got to read a biography of this guy. I'm like I actually shit. I am reading the only biography of this guy, and I don't think it sold well because I've been buying all my books. Actually, Scott, question for you: yep. Do you buy? Do, do you like to have the book in the in its pulped flesh, or do you read books online, or do you reading like Kindles and so on? Are these all paper books? In other words. Silence. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, no. I read almost exclusively paper books, and I'll buy online when they're too pricey. But okay. like, I do a lot of used book sales and library sales. Um, because I'm in. So I'm the same way, and I love the fact that Amazon allows you. I mean, Amazon. I mean, great move on their part to basically not force you to go to another website to buy used books, yep. and they will and. So I am buying books. Most of the books I bought the last, you know, year and a half have been for a buck ninety nine. Yep. And the George Dorio book showed up, and it was in new condition. Oh, wow! And I'm like, shit! I accidentally bought the new book. <laughs> I'm like, God, that was a mistake. <laughs> and then I go to the book. I'm like, oh no, oh no, 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 no! I bought a book. Oh no! I hope this this book should be selling much better because it's an amazing book. Of course, like, look at me. I'm buying it used. I should actually make sure. That <laughs> Um, I think you're going to like that book a lot, Adam. I think you're going to like that book a lot. I really strongly recommend the Creative Capital. I think it's just, and it, I, I think it's probably made much more, I think, visceral for us because I do feel, I mean, Pierre Lamont is on our board is like definitely, I, and I'm dying to ask Pierre what his interaction was with George. But um, the, the, there are th so many things that Dorio says that I can, th that I can hear Pierre say. <laughs> and they're both friends. Yeah. Um, did, 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 did I tell you the stopwatch line that he has? No. <laughs> so Dorio has a stopwatch on his desk. And someone's like, what's the stopwatch for? He's like, well, when I start a meeting, I start the stopwatch, and I see what time it is when someone asks me the same question three times. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, I mean, that is such a purism I cannot tell you. I just like, anyway, I... I the, um, so anyway, I saw that. I saw you adding that. To you, you got a copy of that, oh, and yeah. I'm really looking forward. To it. Yeah, I think you're going to like it a lot. I so Adam, you are also reading a book that's actually not on his list that you're reading right now. I think that you're reading. Uh, is the only other book I'm reading, although I'm listening to it, is uh, is Bowling Alone. Is that cool. what you're referring yeah. to? Was referring to Bowling Alone. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I yeah. Don't, no, I, I just don't I just that. finished that. I just finished it uh, by Robert Putnam. Um, talks about the concept of social capital and how uh, communities used to, uh, you know, be more tight knit and how that has changed over basically the last two centuries. But um, it's written, I think, in like the late '90s or early mm -hmm. 2000s. So there's some very um, sort of adorable speculation about the impact of the internet. And I would, and I would almost say, Cliff esque. There's almost some Silicon Snake oil esque. Uh, yeah, I, so Adam, how did you come across Bowling Alone, first of all? You know, I, I think I, it was on one of our Oxide morning water coolers. You know, we have a okay. kind of a topicless half hour every morning that's opt-in. That's just a good way to, like, start the day and uh, meet your colleagues and talk about things informally. And, and actually, I dropped in, I think, at the tail end of the discussion, and I thought, I, I didn't know what it was, um, but I wrote it down and like took it out on uh, audiobooks and started listening to it and, and was really into it. Yeah. Okay. So I think I, 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 cause I wondered, I'm like, this, uh, is this coming from me or not? Because I mean, I read it when it first came out. I thought it was really interesting, but I have not revisited it. And I would love to know what you're having just read it. Cause I, I feel it does not really anticipate social media. And it no, does no, no, no. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it, uh, it puts a lot of blame on television as like a, a source of eroding social capital, like sort of seems reasonable. Um, it talks about the internet in, in very hopeful terms, right? It's saying that I hope that, you know, the spaces that it makes are kind of fill the same role as social interactions, um, as opposed to merely being virtual communities. 
And, and I actually started thinking about this a bit on last week's space as we were talking about, you know, kind of meeting people through GitHub effectively. Yeah. And it's, it's not quite the same or, or even forums like this. It's not, it's not quite the same, but it, it does fill some of the same role as that more local social capital um, in, in one's community. Hey, I think it does. I agree. With you. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, Adam. Yeah. I'm aware of Putnam's works. And one question for you, since you just read it. Does he put does he give any credence to the economic trend of the 20th and 21st century that we pay for things that used to be free? Um, that was not a big theme. If yeah. That was touched on. One of the, the big econ- one of the great economic catastrophes of the 20th and 21st century is we now spend money for stuff we didn't used to have to. Right. And it, it may it's one of the things that has driven us to a two income society, two income family system. Okay. Right? So, so what are some examples? Now, what are, yeah. We now pay for water, right? Bottled mm-hmm. water is a new thing. Mm-hmm. Coffee used to be a dime a cup or 25 cents a cup. Now it's five bucks. We pay for cable TV. Cell phones didn't used to exist, right? Like there's been a huge value transfer of things we never used to pay for. Yeah, and, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, anyway, it, that's an interesting theme that I think, sort of, it, depending on how far back you're looking, either holds true or not. You know, the, the degree to, of income inc- yeah, inequality. Yeah, it, 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 it's. But I, I think I would look at this as, you know, the bowling alone. It's in. It's in the title, right? We used to have bowling leagues. We don't anymore. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we talked um, about. And yeah. part of it is that we're working more even though we should theoretically be working less, right? Like the, the predictions from the 1900s were that we'd have like a 15 hour work week by now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one of the interesting things was that a lot of social capital comes from work. And, and one of sure. the, one of the interesting things I took away was that the most socially connected folks are not those who are unemployed and not those who are working, but the folks who are working part-time. Because I guess that, you know, having the the social interactions um, of work gives you a, a bunch of connection both to your community and outside your community. But then working part time gives you the space to act on it, to to volunteer, to go out into communities, to to do other things. Um, and so that that may be true that that uh, that like, you know, people working more has eroded social capital. But there, you know, there's a bunch of advances in the progressive era where. Uh, you know, the 40 hour work week was instituted, you know, anti-child labor laws were instituted. So, you know, this, this has fluctuated. True. Well, and I, I, and I think you do get to, I mean, which we rightfully don't necessarily emphasize because the dark side is so dark, but there is a bright side to social networking and social networking has actually, I mean, we have remained very social. I mean, I think that w- one of the concerns in Boeing alone, as I recall it, was that we were becoming increasingly isolated and actually, what the much bigger concern really should have been is that the people who feel increasingly isolated are going to connect with one another. And that feeling of isolation and disenfranchisement and grievance is going to be magnified. And you're going to end up with, I mean, like the book does not predict 4chan, which would be hard to predict. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think that w- what we've seen is actually much more complicated yes. than... But, you- you know, it's interesting. You know, the, he talks about two kinds of social capital: one, bridging versus bonding social capital. Bridging being reaching across communities, bonding meaning insular. Mm. And to some degree, I think that his fear of the internet, some of it has played out, where you get more bonding social capital, yeah, where which... it become. And, and I think we see both of these things in our society, where the internet has facilitated bonding social capital to the point where it becomes toxic, where, where it becomes too focused on us versus the other. Yeah. Um, but then, but then also bridging social capital, which allows us to, for example, support folks in Ukraine in ways yeah. that, you know, yeah. m- might not have been accessible certainly 20, 30 years ago. Yes, very much so. Yeah. It is, so do you, it, it, net, net, uh, Adam, do you recommend it? I definitely have not reread it. Strongly so recommend it. Strongly recommend it. And, and actually, the, and maybe this is getting too personal, but it even sort of, it kind of filled, you know, the, the I, I mean, what it certainly did not predict was the pandemic, which has been really deleterious to any kind of social capital. Um, and, uh, and, and I think as, you know, during the pandemic, I've moved. You know, my kids have moved around schools. My wife has moved around jobs. I, you know, I moved jobs right before the pandemic, uh, like 
uh, you know, surprising. I, it's hard to imagine, Brian. I felt like I joined way before the pandemic, but we were actually only in the office for like two months together. Yeah, it was um, But um, it, it's been a very useful lens for thinking about, you know, the the meaning of community and and how I want to spend my time and spend my money and spend my effort. Uh, in terms of like, you know, um, creating events for, for friends and for folks in my kids' classes and, and, uh, and you know, for folks, uh, you know, just in the community. So it's, it's been uh, like instrumental. I mean, it's been really, it, it, it's kind of changed the way I think about things um, and, and change, changed the way I think about online and, and uh, in-person interactions. So I it's highly recommend interesting. it. That's interesting. That's interesting. And Scott, you mentioned that you were kind of familiar with Putnam's broader work. Did he? I wonder if he's has he come back? And I mean, is he still alive? This is like a little awkward. Um, the book was written a while ago, but is he, I wonder if he's revisited some of the stuff in the post the age. Um, I'm not. I'm not certain. I remember I looked up the book not too long ago um, on Wikipedia, and I didn't. I didn't delve too much into him, um, but I had, somebody brought up the thesis to me, and I was curious about it. Yeah, so he is alive. It looks like he's still writing. Yeah, it looks like he's got a couple of new books out. The upswing. How America came together. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. All right, we'll have to go. uh, I I would be curious to go read that. And and that's great to know. I I mean, it was also, and Scott, one thing I'd definitely be interested to ask you, it makes such a difference when a book is well-written. And that book was well-written. I mean, just like the the mechanic. Absolutely. Um, and it, it, that makes a, 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 a big, big difference. Um, I've got a, another recommendation that I picked up that has now that has the same purpose on my bookshelf that it has on Tom Lyons' bookshelf. Tom, you recommended Makers of the Microchip, a documentary history of Fairchild. And, but you said, like, I haven't read this yet because it's pretty dense. And I'm like, pish posh, how dense? I buy it. It's very dense. I have not. <laughs> it's is, it is like, it's engineering notebooks from Fairchild. It's really remarkable. Oh. But uh, definitely, uh, I, I like Tom. I'm like, I strongly recommend it, even though I have only really just leafed through it. It's, but it's been really mesmerizing. And I don't think, I don't know if that was on your, your list. Again, not a that, No, that, that is yeah. not on my list. Um, yeah, the, it's, it's seriously uh, thick. It is seriously thick, but yeah, it's it, it, it's really fascinating. I have to say, I'm good. So I'm going to retell on his behalf. So uh, we had we've had exactly one in person board meeting um, <laughs> since the the, uh, the pandemic started. Uh, we had a board meeting in March, and um, we got to get lunch with um, with Pierre at uh, Pierre Lamont's on the board afterward. And uh, you know, Pierre does not like to tell stories about himself, so it's a bit of a trick to get him going. Um, but the guy has had so much wildly fascinating experience. And what he described in particular was he was at Fairchild Semiconductor running the semiconductor division and recall that it is a subdivision of Fairchild Camera and Instrument, right, Tom? That is correct. Yeah. yeah. And he is back in Long Island presenting the, their results to the board. And Pierre says the numbers we were doing were obscene. And I feel I know Pierre well enough to know that if he's calling profitability obscene, it's a truly an obscenity. I mean, it is, it, that is like, uh, um, and he said it was obscene. We were making so much money. The company was doing so well. And the CEO was falling asleep during his presentation. And he's like, what am I doing here? Why am I? And that's kind of like where he had that moment of like, I have to leave. And he ultimately goes and can't start now bc does not eat george dorio aside yep. and although now i understand because G- dorio hates california which i think is kind of funny um uh pierre can't raise venture capital so they go and basically find an extant public company national semiconductor and he and two colleagues from fairchild more or less take it over and replace the management and then and then issue uh the, on the public markets they raise money that way um, but anyway, that, that was a, a, a fair child story oh. for you, Tom, from back in the day. Uh, that was, it was also a great moment because we had a couple of Oxide folks kind of around the table as Pierre was saying this and everyone was kind of like slack jawed listening to this. I mean, just like, it was, uh, it was amazing. Oh. Um, hey, another book that came up, um, was that someone had suggested was built to fail that I loved about Blockbuster. I don't know. Yeah, that was my stuff. suggestion. From that was your suggestion. Oh, Ian, I love that one. 
I that that was that was really good. It is it is such a good book. I mean, it's <laughs> it's about a company that learns how to grow and then continues to grow beyond any point of rationality. And it's uh, uh, definitely an interesting read. And this one, I think, Scott, this was also not on your list. Um, I'm not sure. Just, just so you're aware, there are a lot more books. I know. I knew this was coming. I, I was ready for this moment. I was ready for this moment exactly. And I thought going into the space that this was the book that was going to bring this up. I knew this because I'm like, he has got like 15 more uh, lists. The, the, He's only saying yeah, like start up. Yeah, more. This, this, only this, this is all. I this was I what I did was I, I, I called down to high tech startups, right? Or high tech companies. I, I knew it. And I, and I, I knew le- it. I left I it. off some of my favorites, like um, uh, the Skunk Works book um, by Ben Rich. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. That's a great one. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, the, so, another great one is James Dyson, which talks about the founding of Dyson and, and his and the best wheelbarrow ever made by mankind, um, which is just phenomenal. Okay, I w- w- what's it called? Is it just it, James? Is it, it's on. James it's Dyson. on James Dyson. Uh, what I will do is I will put together other. I will, I will add other books to the list. Um, but so if you're are, are are you either you guys homeowners? Okay. Yes. So yep. one of Dyson's first products was called the Ball Barrow, and it was a wheelbarrow that had a giant round sphere as its central ball. So it right. didn't cut a hole through your lawn. You have a lot of crap loaded into it. Right. Uh, right. It could know, go. It, phenomenal. It, right. right. The man's a great, the man's a great engineer, even if it's vacuums don't work all that well. <laughs> His vacuums drive me crazy. Yes, they do. I, I, okay. This is actually, I thank you because I feel like when you've got a Dyson vacuum cleaner, you're like, I feel it's, it's a, like it's a, actually it's a, another, it's or like I feel it's like a con where it's like I have spent so much money for this vacuum cleaner that I'm afraid to go to the police because I'm going to disclose <laughs> that. It, 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 like I, I, I'm basically revealing my own poor judgment. So it's like I have to like this vacuum cleaner, even though I cannot figure out how. And it's like because it, it, they have this idea like no no you don't need documentation because it is a self documenting vacuum cleaner it's like fuck you this thing is too clever by half and then you go like on the online documentation adam do you have a dyson vacuum cleaner in my i have two and i love them both and they treat me well please continue <laughs> <laughs> i knew it i knew it i knew it meanwhile you are suffering in silence and you're weeping right now because you can't figure out how to get the extender out and you're just like not not only not only do i have two but i recently did a battery replacement on one with some like I don't know, some like toxic waste battery that I bought off of Amazon for like eight dollars or whatever. But I rehabilitated the vacuum cleaner that my family wouldn't use. I I, I love them so much. And you were able to like appreciate it. And in, in, in replacing this battery, of course I didn't need the documentation because I appreciated the innate cleverness of the design that allowed me to do it completely. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So yeah. a comment about Dyson. Um Dyson is British, obviously, and there's a whole alternate British high tech, high tech world. That we don't that we don't yes. see, um, you know, the Acorn Risk Box, the the BBC, oh, you can the BBC Micro, yeah, the BBC Micro, micro totally. Uh, also, just just suggest that ENIAC is the first stored program computer. If you want every I, British follower of yours to come I, co- flying, I, I after have you. long employed British engineers, and they're one of my favorite nationalities for engineers. <laughs> Interesting, and the, and the so I, the, is there a good history of the? I mean, this is where we need John Masters here. I, I, John Masters has God save the Queen in his head right now, and he doesn't know why. <laughs> um, about the kind of thing because the history of the industry is actually really interesting. You've got Elliot is over there. Um, there are a bunch of interesting computer companies. Obviously, you should mention BBC Micro, Acorn, Arm. Obviously, starts over there. Um, you've got uh, Sinclair. The, uh, Sinclair, right? Um, you guys know about the the Lions uh, computing computer from the fifties? No, I don't know that one. No, it, it was the first commercially built computer in the world. Really? Yeah, you know, Univac was built for the government, but this was built to run accounting at the Lions tea shops, and it was a clone of the EdSec from Cambridge. Really? Oh wow! Interesting. And there's a oh. bunch of books on it. Um. Ooh. Hey. Hey. The, 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 yeah, what, what, yeah, what, what do you have on it? That, that sounds interesting. Uh, I forget the title. So you can look for Leo 
It was the name of the computer, Lions Electronic Office. Hey, hey, Tom, I have a question. I have a question what? for you. What's your thought on uh -huh. the inmost transputer? I think it's very cool. I never really got okay. to know it. Like, I, I always looked at it as, like, Dick Pountain used to write about that one a lot. And it was just a, I always thought it was a fascinating architecture that I never quite understood. And then I guess the same team went on to do the Quadrix networking stuff for supercomputers. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Which, which was, I think, the first Ethernet-based supercomputer interconnect. And this is UK-based as well, right? Yep. Yeah, there's a huge amount of stuff out of Cambridge. And, I mean, Cambridge is the Silicon Valley of the UK. Also, including a language for which we have dedicated several Easter eggs, Adam. Language H? Language H is is an English creation. The, uh, when I I bought a, a an odd lot of uh, just like crap from like a bunch of ICT stuff, and it was just like a miscellaneous stuff. And at the bottom is this manual from Language H, which is so weird. We found it very delightful. And this it has this is before decimalization um, in the UK. So things like you know guineas or is a keyword or whatever. I mean, I. It, it was, <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh yeah, this this uh, Lion the the Leo computer had hardware support for the non decimal <laughs> uh, stuff. It's just like just mind, mind boggling <laughs> for like well, shillings and stuff like that. that. Must have been yeah. crazy. Yeah. But I, I would argue that Cambridge was directly responsible for a lot of the programming language stuff that we use. I mean, C came from B, which came from BCPL, which came from CPL, which was the Cambridge programming language. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Yeah, would it be? There does, <clears throat> there does appear to be a book about Sinclair called Sinclair and the Sunrise Technology. I'm kind of curious to read it mostly because of the pivot late into electric vehicles. Having seen the Sinclair C5 at um, the Forney Museum of Transportation in, in Denver, Colorado, it was definitely ahead of its time, would be uh, charitable. I think. <laughs> But it's, uh, it's, it's got to be an interesting story for sure. Well, it, it's, do, do you know there, there's a there's a mo movie about Clive Sinclair, which is a dramatization, and uh, it includes a startup of the Acorn stuff, and it, it, yeah, with with actors acting as all these things. It's a very strange movie. Uh, is this called. Micro Men, Tom? Would that make sense? Uh, yep, 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 yep. All right, micro men. We'll have to. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get the kids to sit through this one with me or not. That was, looks like it's all built <laughs> on YouTube, fortunately. Yeah, I don't. I don't understand who they built, who they made the movie for. It's one of these very strange movies. Well, it's actually it like it's going to be challenging to get the kids to watch that. You know, the kids actually have been maybe they're just being charitable, but they've actually. Uh, my my 15 year old has watched watched Silicon Cowboys with me, which is very good. Watched. Um, I think something veteran was the history of venture capital, which was really enjoyable. And this looks so Tom seven point five on IMDb, but ninety percent, ninety six percent like the movie. This looks good. Yeah, this is this is a <laughs> dramatization. Oh, it was on BBC Four. Oh, interesting. I know, right, yeah, this looks good. This looks, this looks like yeah, thanks for the recommendation. <laughs> And I, I met Herman Hauser in real life, and then he's one of the characters in the movie. It's like, uh, wait, this is too weird. <laughs> that is awesome. So, what, Scott? One question I've got for you that I have found is that that part of the reason I like reading a bunch of different stuff is there's what I call like a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern effect. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I I love the movie Rosencrantz and Guildenstern because the, it, it focuses on these bit characters in Hamlet while Hamlet is happening behind. Them. Correct. So Hamlet is like happening in the background, and you, the and I just I love that idea of like there are so many different stories, and actually the story Hamlet story is actually not the only story that's happening in the castle, and there's other stories that are just as interesting as the people living them. And I find it super interesting when you like read a book that has in the background something that you've read an entire book about, or something that's like yep. oh wait a minute, yep. I, I really like that, and I notice you've got. You tend to read a bunch of books on one subject, so you must have that feeling quite a bit. Indeed. And the interesting part is always, like, there are heroes that aren't the leads, right? Like, you look at, um, mm. to go back to Soul the New Machine, the guy who left for the commune, he had his own story, right? Hmm. And he was yeah. clearly, and 
when you're running an engineering team, one of the things that that's it's it's always an interesting challenge is assigning the problem to the right type of engineer, right? And one bit of art is when you've got a certain class of problems, you don't give it to somebody who's too smart, right? Like when it's a really hard problem, a lot of times you can get a huge win by giving it to a junior guy because the smart hmm, guy yes, knows yeah. how hard it is and won't solve it. Right. And this is the Neil Firth story from Soul of a New Machine. Yep. Um, where Neil Firth famously does the simulator because no one wants to pick it up because they know what a hard problem yep. is. And he's able to get the simulator working. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I'm a big believer in that, that oh, it's yeah. actually, it's very important to not necessarily know the odds. <laughs> because often, oftentimes like that, that the wisdom is right in a certain regard and that the problem is much harder than a more junior person might think, but also wrong in that it actually ultimately is solvable. And you've got to have that disposition when, when you solve it. Indeed. Uh, um, another book that, that I can't, Oh, actually I've got a book that is, that is another one that's I think not on your list, but now I'm worried that it's on one of your shadow lists. Um, Out of the inner circle. Do you know this book by Bill Landreth? So this is like a down market cuckoo's egg. Out of the cuckoo's egg by Yep, Bull. I remember. I read that one too. Okay, so right, so uh, cuckoo's egg, I think, is actually very it is. Good. I, 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 Adam, have you read cuckoo's egg? No, I haven't. What what is this about? So the, the cuckoo's egg is about Cliff Stoll, who is a um, an astronomer who's also an admin for their network, and how he discovers yes. that the network is being being abused by a German hacker to jump off and basically commit a crime. But it's actually a, a very well written book. There's a great line in there. I and uh, Scott, just to your earlier point, that, like these, but it's great when you get like one kind of thing out of a book. Cliff Stoll had a really interesting observation about himself. He's like, I actually realized that th what it meant to be multidisciplinary because all the astronomers thought I wasn't much of an astronomer, but I was a great computer guy. And all the computer folks thought I was not much of a computer person, but great was astronomer. a great astronomer. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So he ended up being, and I think, which I think is the, the cross-disciplinary curse often. Um, but that book is very good. So the, um, it, it, Out of the Inner Circle is a book written by a guy who basically was a, a, a hacker in the 80s. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's Bill Landreth, and then underneath it, AKA The Cracker. Um, and this book is, my copy is very important to me, namely that it doesn't fall into the wrong hands because I bought my copy when I was 16 and inspired by Bill Landreth, gave myself a moniker that I, embarrassingly, and I did just check this, <laughs> this that is, it, it is, it is written down underneath my name. <laughs> I wrote my name in the book and then wrote down what I viewed to be my outlaw moniker. And I think it's just, even though I'm an oversharer, I think it's just too important. <laughs> that book is apparently co-written by Howard Rheingold, which is quite interesting. He was the person who wrote um, Homesteading on the Digital Frontier. I think that's the title. Talking so about the well you know? and the oh, early rise. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Homestead, so it, and you said that Out of the Inner Circle was or, or Cuckoo's Egg? Uh, no, 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 no. Out of the inner circle. I just looked it up on Wikipedia. It said it was by this Bill Landreth guy who I've never heard of, but it was also by Howard Rheingold, who I had heard of. Oh, that's interesting. It, it, that is not credited. It, at least in my copy, never to see the light of day because of the embarrassment. You should, you should scratch out that name with the selfie, by the way, just so, you know. <laughs> uh, really? <laughs> uh, all right. Just saying. Dude, no, that's, that's right. Um, but this actually may be, that's interesting. So that, and is Homesteading on the Digital Frontier, is that worth reading, Dan? I think so, yeah. I, I, I can't remember if that's the actual title of the, it, it, of the book. That discusses the sort of early history yeah. of the well. It, yeah. Is itself kind it, of every, Everything that happened um, online, like the rule, the rule of thumb is everything that happened online happened first on the well. And the, the argument is that it actually happened first on Plato. Right. Yeah, I would, would, again. Yeah, I would buy uh, that. Sure. <laughs> well, there, there's another another recent book that covers some of the well stuff as the Stuart Brand biography. It's called Whole Earth. Oh. oh that you, one. It's a uh, by John Markov. So it's a really good book. It's not oh, exactly that's a high tech. Um, right. But then Mar Markov had the other really good book, which is uh, what the Dormouse yes, said. What the Dormouse said. Good. That's on my queue, Tom. Yeah. That's a you read it. Book. Yeah, yeah Mark it's, it's awesome. Lot, lots of early Silicon Valley, LSD, Grateful mm -hmm. Dead. <laughs> you know, every, everything happening in the 70s kind of stuff. 
the Grateful Dead also figures prominently in the Cuckoo's Egg, which, like, Brian, I, I think one of the things that's interesting to mention about that is that the German hacker guy was being funded by the then, this was all during the backdrop of the Cold War. This was all happening in the 80s. Right. And the German hacker guy was being paid in cash and cocaine by the KGB to break into American military computers. <laughs> so at some point, Cliff stole like this long haired hippie dude in Berkeley is watching this guy break into some, you know, vax or something at some, you know, the Aniston Army Depot in, in Alabama somewhere. And he's like calling this army base. And he's like, I need to talk to whoever runs your computers and the people at the front, you know, whatever, whatever switchboard he gets to, the people are just like, who are you, man? <laughs> like, what's what are you talking about? It, it it's a very interesting read. It's a very it, it's also a very lively book. I highly recommend yep. Cuckoo's Egg. Yeah, it, it sounds like you read Cuckoo's Egg a little more recently, Nick. I don't. I think I read that in last well, read that in the nineties for sure. I've not read that recently. I I'm trying to remember when the last time I read it um, was. So when I was taking care of my mom at the end of her life, there was a copy of it in her house, and I probably read it around that time just to you know have something to do. Um, so that was probably like a year or two ago. Oh, right. 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 Sort of last, last week through that book, but it's it's a good read. I highly it's recommend. It's a good read. Yeah, yeah. and that's yeah. I, I will say th this discussion. I pulled it up. I have read this, and it was probably in like 1992 that I read it. So, uh, but these details are bringing it back. Yeah. Have you uh, have uh, you seen the video on YouTube of how Clifford Stoll manages the inventory of his uh, Klein bottle online store? No, I would that. I, that could go any direction because I won't. I won't spoil it for you, but you should definitely look it up. It's uh, a wild hazard system. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he because so he wrote Cuckoo's Egg. Cuckoo's Egg got him a lot of notoriety, and then he kind of made the mistake of I gather his publisher or an editor basically suggested that he write another book and gave him the topic, and he wrote this book, Silicon Snake Oil, that is really. I mean, it's interesting only in its how unbelievably wrong it is about what unfolded with respect to the, but basically talking about, I mean, it was ironic because he was basically kind of taking, I mean, if you take Putnam and kind of extract from it, that the internet was going to make us asocial. And it's like, Oh no, no, no. Wish it did. Did not. <laughs> that, that, in, in some ways, Cliff Stoll, your dystopian future would have been better than the one we found. Um, but it's definitely completely wrong. But I, I, I really want to, you're definitely inspiring Dan to go back and reread Cuckoo's Egg because it, it was, I do remember being really good. Um, on, so a, a, a book that I did not see on your list, Scott. Oh, actually, before that, a question for you because actually this conversation with Dan brings us up. One of the things that I've appreciated in older age is going, that I never thought I would be doing, going back and rereading yep. books, which I hadn't really done yep. much of. But certainly this happened with Soul, where I go back to reread a book. And of course, like I know that the younger Brian is an idiot. And I've learned this countless number of times. But it's like, I, I apparently, I'm, I'm not getting too old to relearn this lesson, where I will go read a book that I read at a much younger station in life, much earlier station in life, and just get something totally, totally different. different out of it. Yeah. I, did Absolutely. you find that as well? Um, you know, like, sometimes you identify too much with a, prota with a protagonist to, to, and you miss something. Right. Like that's a, yeah, that's a common one. The other time, the other thing is sometimes you need the wisdom of years. Right. You need you need the yeah. the tread on the highway, so to speak. Um, I, uh, and I definitely thought that way about the shootout at Hojo's, which I like, again, I did not even did not move the needle when I read it basically before I'd even finished my undergraduate work, but now like shoot out of Hojo's just like you and your experience, oh, yeah. like, Oh my God. I'm oh, yeah. there. <laughs> um, and, yeah. and like, also a lot of it is like when you're really young and you haven't yet failed, you don't have an understanding of failure. Um, and, and, yeah. Okay. Good. You, you elaborate well, on that. That's really interesting. Um, like I have made my living realist kind of, but like the way I kind of described it is I kind of exist on the margins of high tech, right? Like I tend to focus on small, small environments. Like I, I like companies of about 10 people, right? And that means that there's a limit as to how well, how well you can succeed, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. You yeah. know, I do mostly what I do is I'm a, I'm a, I, I'm a, cons I've done a bunch of startups over the years. Some worked, some didn't. Um, these days I'm a consultant and trying to do some good things on the side. Um, and I'm going to put a, is it, is it all right if I make a plug for something? Sure. Um, yeah, please. Yeah. I think I know you're going to make a plug for, so go ahead. Um, 
Um, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah, so have I that. a buddy of mine that I've known for about 35 years. Um, he put a post on Facebook about a month ago saying, I'm appalled by the Ukraine. I want to do something. I don't know what to do. So I called some pizza places and gave him some money and they delivered pizzas to bomb shelters. And I reached out mm. to him and said, hey, I can build a website. And 24 hours later, we had a website up. And since then, we have generated uh, about 30,000 in donations. And we have sent over 1,800 pizzas to the Ukraine. That's and amazing. In, that's in, yeah, that's great. I, I don't know what form factor your servers will ship in, but we have a whole spreadsheet that measures <laughs> the pizzas along different, along different um, lines. And we have shipped, uh, let me just pull it up here. Uh, pizza math, which is here. So if my measurements are correct and what the internet tells me a 2U server is, we have shipped 31,697 2U servers in height of pizzas. <laughs> there you go. Nice. That's great. Um, right. We That's also awesome. measure it by smoots if you're an MIT person. Um, we've got a measure. What's what that? is a smoot? Oh, <laughs> you don't oh, know smoot. what a smoot is? <laughs> yeah, you don't know what a, a, a smoot at the height yeah. of Mr. Smoot. And uh, yeah, the, the Harvard Bridge, which goes from Boston to Cambridge, has markings on it that say X many smoots to, you know, to, to MIT or whatever. It's, it's, okay. um, so yeah. if you want to send, spend 15 bucks, you can send a pizza to a bomb shelter in the Ukraine. Um, or put a link on, awesome. on Twitter or Facebook or something, right? Get the word out. Um, and yeah, it is 100% zero overhead charity. There's, we, we take nothing from it. All we do is take the money and send, right. it, out, send it on to a couple of pizza places in Ukraine. So, Which, I mean, talk about, I mean, going back to like bowling alone and how, they, I mean, that's like, that's, this is a dynamic that yep. does not exist in, you know, in, in the, you know, in your conflict in the eighties or nineties. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that is really interesting. That, that is, that's great. Um, so I want to get just, just because I, we, we are kind of doing the update. If other folks have got books that they have read in the interim that they would love folks to read or thought that particularly stuck with them, definitely um, l let us know. Cause we, I feel like we, we learned a lot from the, the last time. Certainly my queue got very deep the last time. So um, one, actually another one I wanted to ask you about Scott was, um, and Tom, maybe you as well. Um, Memoirs of a computer pioneer by Morris Wilkes. Do you, I, I don't know if you we were talking about UK computing for a little bit. Um, I was not aware of that. Then. Which one was that, Brian? Oh, it's uh, the Morris Wilkes. So this is, I mean, I mean, talk about like the origins of UK computing. This is super old, right? This is the, what I think he's the, like, I'm going to say second Turing award winner or something like that. But the, um, he um, is a, a, a computing pioneer in, in the UK and um, very yeah, much. He was the main guy be, behind EdSec. He's got he invented. Here. That's a subroutine. Oh, and like that. damn! That most he, he 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 wrote the very first book on programming, <laughs> preparation of programs for an automatic digital computer. Wow! But I wasn't aware that he had a memoir. Um, um hey Brian, have have you ever looked at um? The book "Insisting on the Impossible." It talks. It's the coverage of Edwin Land and Polaroid. No, how's that? Amazing. Mm. Um, you, we, we have Polaroids are an invention lost to history at this point. Yeah. But the number of sort of material science advances that Edwin Land was responsible for um, is just phenomenal. Um, and like, you know, Polaroid was a Cambridge thing. Yeah. So like. You know, we, like it was very, very familiar to me. Fantastic book. That's awesome. That reminds me of this book that I think I was reading the last time we did this with um, on um, on uh, Gerber um, and the, the life of Joseph Gerber, which was also super, super interesting. Um, but that looks great. Uh, Ian, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I've got a few uh, from uh, that I didn't mention the last time. Um, the first is called Broadband, the untold story of the women who made the internet. Um, this is a, a kind of a, a book that kind of spans the ages a little bit, um, starting with ENIAC, which I think is something that 
uh, you're interested in, Brian, uh, but it does go through um, early days of the internet and uh, online communities and hypertext. Um, the world does rate a mention in there as well, which kind of ties it back to the early conversation. So um, that's, uh, that's what That looks out. great. And yes, I got the ENIAC story is actually part of what's really compelling about the ENIAC story is that all of these first programmers are women. And uh, so many of them went on to then really distinguished careers. Um, yeah, it was. So yeah, this looks great. That's a good one. Yeah, there's there's also a, a kind of spin off from that that I have called uh, that I've got in my queue called Cyberville, um, because of a, a story that's in that book. There's a story in the book where a uh, one of these um, early communities kind of explodes in popularity, and they're running it out of their New York City apartment, <laughs> and uh, they basically run out of bandwidth, um, and the the uh, phone company ends up ripping up the street to be able to lay more phone lines to this one person's apartment so that they could actually run a slightly larger community, which I thought was a... Uh, and so I believe this is Cyberville Clicks, Culture and the Creation of an Online Town. Is that right? Yes, that's the one. Uh, yeah, this looks this looks good. So, sorry, I'm getting that, that cheapest copy I'm getting right now. Sorry, folks, you got to move. If you want to if you, if you get the 309 <laughs> copy, you got to move quickly. Um. um yeah, so I have yeah, a few go. more. Uh, the next is called Becoming Trader Joe, How I Did Business My Way and Still Beat the Big Guys. Phenomenal um, book. That is, that is a great book. It is an excellent book, uh, and I'm glad that you've read it. Uh, yeah, it's uh, a, a, lot, a lot of interesting history about Trader Joe's, which I really did not know anything about going into the book, um, particularly as someone who... Uh, did not come to right. the states in the time that this was yes. was produced, and and was also like a, a, a West Coast, West Coast thing only, only yeah. for yeah. a number of years. Well, and the amazing thing about Trader Joe's is that he's been gone forever, and the culture stayed the same. I don't know how. They oh did. yes, that doesn't surprise me at all, actually, because I, I feel like uh, one of the big lessons that I got from the, the reading these various memoirs and histories and so on is just how much the culture does reflect the founders of a company, especially, I mean, I, Apple right now is secretive because of the dead Steve Jobs. I mean, Steve Jobs has been gone for over a decade, right? And, and they are still so much of his, partic his particularities are still exhibited by Apple. So that's, but yeah, this looks good. I have not, um, Adam, do you shop at your address? You trade address? Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, um, uh, let me, if you're, if you're, if we're opening this up to food, <laughs> um, hold on, I need to watch this, that this, wing of the house this, this, a second. Hold on. <laughs> um, oh, what is, um, McGillney's gold talks about the history of Tabasco. <laughs> and if you want, if you want to dive deep into history, that is an amazing Oh my God. Book. Um, and you, you, if you think there are characters in high tech, you have no idea. Does it go into the MRE thing? Uh, yes, it does go into the MRE thing. Outstanding. That's awesome. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a fast, it's a fascinating, it's a utterly like it's, and it's short too. It's like, it's not a killer. Um, but it's a really fascinating. Uh, what are some of the killers? Now I want to know what you're, I mean, you're such a voracious reader. What, what can slay you? Um, so they invented, they essentially invented the company town, right? Now, does that term mean anything to anyone other than me? Uh, other than me? The company, the term company town? Yeah. I mean, I grew up in Colorado. Yeah. Ludlow was in Colorado, which is the very, very famous right? company. So, so like they, they, except their company town was on an island and the, the, whoever was running McKilney's was essentially the patriarch right down to faith healing people when they were sick. Okay, so this is McKilney. Okay, so McKilney is M-C-I-L-H-E-N-N-Y. Okay, yep, I got it. Yep. McKilney's Gold, How a Louisiana Family Built the Tobacco Empire. <laughs> and and it, it, it is, I mean, it is utter 18th century madness. <laughs> Adam, I can see you reading this book. Am I the only one seeing you reading this book? Oh yeah, no, <laughs> for sure. I'm I'm looking at that dollar sixty copy right now. Damn it, it's gone. I I've got to I've got to shut up two thirty two now for a copy. 
Um, I would say that while we're on the concept of company towns, uh, another book that I've purchased, but I've only read the first chapter or so, is called The Engine That Could, 75 Years of Value-Driven Change at Cummins Engine Mm. Company. So I'm not sure how many of you will be familiar with Cummins Engine, but they make make good engines. They make good diesel engines for, you know, some automotive and some industrial applications. Uh, and I've it's got a generator been around it. for a very long time. Hmm. That is interesting. That's an, this is an old book. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Tom. You, what were you going to say there? Oh, I, I, have a, I have a Cummins generator up in my remote house. Oh, yeah. Um, so the reason why I got onto this book was I saw the movie After Yang, um, which I highly recommend. Uh, and I was kind of curious as to what the director had done uh, other than that movie. I came across their previous movie, Columbus, from 2017, uh, and was curious about why Columbus, Indiana was kind of a hotbed of architecture. So ended up on an NPR article, uh, Columbus, Indiana, a Midwestern mecca of architecture, where it you know came to light that it was mostly through um, co-funding by... Cummins Engine Company that Columbus ended up with great architecture and it was basically them trying to make it a town that people wanted to move to so that they could attract people from you know MIT and other uh, institutions to move out to this very small midwestern town yep not too far from where I am actually (laughs) speaking of movement of people but taking it back virtually I'd recommend the Cyber Gypsies by Indra Singh. It's um, kind of contemporary to the Well book, uh, the Virtual Communities thing by Howard Rangold, but it's very it's a very different perspective. He's like a reporter. He lives in the UK. He gets addicted to muds in the 80s and then basically writes the story of the people that he meets on these online communities and sort of the nascent internet. It's sort of a fascinating tale. Is that Murder mm-hmm. Chesapeake? No. I don't know. What... Yeah, and, and <laughs> Amazon know. is not re- returning good results for that, but I'll find it. Okay. Sorry, Dan, what, what did you say was the name of that book? Cyber Gypsies. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Yeah, that... So going back to more techie things, I have a couple of books. Yeah. Um, uh, one I posted on Twitter, but it's this uh, Circuits, Packets, and Protocols by James Pelkey. And it's uh, based on interviews that Pelkey did with all the leaders in the net- networking industry, but it was all back in 1988. So it covers their personal stories and entrepreneurial stories from 1968 to 1988. Oh, wow. Oh, of a, wow. Bunch of, of a bunch, bu- bunch of different companies. And it's really, really good reading. And it, it, it stops when things like TCP IP versus OSI are undecided, token ring versus Ethernet are undecided. Uh, okay, that one's going to be a library book. <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah, that one's 60 so, bucks. That looks good, though. Yeah, it's just been published, so it's probably hard to get the cheap. Oh, cheap it's, got it. This is not an old book. This is a brand new book. Okay, got it. Then. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. And then the... The other one I'm reading right now is uh, The Man from the Future, the biography of John von Neumann. How is it? Ooh. Very nice. Very good. So a lot a lot of just right level of detail in, in terms of the mathematical contributions and stuff. I am worried about meeting my heroes on that one. I'm worried that <laughs> the... I, because you know, I the, the story of ENIAC gave me a more... that I... I, I uh, John von Neumann definitely made some animes um, in terms of like w- what his role was for a programming computer. So I, um, it, Tom, are you coming away? How are you coming away with that feeling about 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 Johnny there? Well, he was classic uh, on the spectrum, not not that good with people kind of guy, right? But uh, but really, it, it was Goldstein who took his first draft of the of the whatever it was and published it widely. And uh, without von Neumann's participation, so that that's what really messed up Eckerd and Mouth- Mouthley. Yeah, interesting. 
And so you're reading that now. You re- recommend that one? Yeah. Yeah, looks good. yeah. yeah. And uh, it, it, this is the one that turned up from, I, in an interview I saw with the author. He turned up the the fact that they had modified ENIAC to become a stored program computer. And that actually was the first software to run slightly beating out the Manchester baby, which was previously thought to be the first. Interesting. I find that like, I kind of don't care who was first, but then all of the protagonists in that care so deeply about who's first that I kind of got more interested in it than I thought I would be otherwise. I, cause ultimately like, yeah, it, yeah. It, I feel like if you've got a bunch of people that are in a fight for the death over who was first, it's like, Hey, I hate to break it to everybody, but this was going to happen no matter what that, you know, yeah. it, I, I, you know what I mean? Well, it, it, it's like, if, if it's that, like, maybe this wasn't like that hard. Sorry. I mean, I, versus like when you've got folks that are all by their lonesome doing things where there's no disputed authorship because they were, you know, like Edwin Land and Polaroid. Um, I don't know the, the, there's a degree to which the, 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 the disputes over who was first are kind of uninteresting, but then that one people care about so much. It is kind of fascinating. Well, it, this, this book lays out how von Neumann's concept of stored program was clearly influenced by uh, both Kurt, von, Kurt Gödel, uh with his whatever it was, assigning numbers to math, and also the Turing machine, because those are both kind of software concepts, but that clearly influenced how how von Neumann thought of thought computers should be. Is the stored program computer obvious? I don't know. In retrospect, I mean, I don't. I don't. Know. I know this is like this is sacrilege, but it, it, it is. Also, there's the jacquard loom, right? Where right. You can there, think of the cards as yeah, but but you're not really storing the program and modifying it. Yeah. We place such credence on heroes. Yeah. And we want them to be infallible, right? So, like, we really want them to be, oh, only this guy could have done it. Um, an awful lot of inventions in history happen concurrently because it's simply time for them. That's right. And I feel like it was it was the ti- it was it, time. It, for it, the it was timing, right? And and part of the, part of the issue was the problem had certain characteristics, and one of those characteristics was that the world was getting more complex with more information. Yeah. A stored program computer was how you were going to solve it, regardless of the details in the implementation. Like we can debate how the cards yeah. looked, right, and what shape they should have been, but it was going to happen. Yeah. On the other hand, von Neumann was clearly, you know, several orders of magnitude smarter <laughs> yes. Than, yes. than any of us. <laughs> yes, absolutely. absolutely. So, so maybe yeah. he accelerated it by 10 or 20 years. Yeah. 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 It's kind of, kind of unknowable at some level. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, the, uh, the other um, I, I, actually a book that I've, I've actually wanted to ask you about. It's been on my queue for a while, and I really feel I need to buckle down and read it. It's IBM and the Holocaust. Um, Scott, have you read that? I have not. That I I, I have some aversions to reading that one. Okay. I know what I know what's there, but I spent a year working at the ADL, so like that one's kind of hard for me. Uh, is, so what are your aversions, if you don't want me asking? Are you worried about the reportage, or are you just like, um, a, a like subject? Ba- basically, what's going to ha- what, what's going to happen if my understanding of it is correct is IBM made a bunch of money working for the Nazis, and that's kind of crappy. And the problem is, is that we're applying a 21st century lens of ethics onto facts which were not as apparent at the time. So what I've been told that, about this book is that, like, no, no, no. It actually was apparent at the time, and there are a bunch. So the the thing that I, the um, if you read um, the uh, in the Garden of Beasts, no. um, that, that's another uh, interesting one by the author of Devil in the White City um, about how uh, FDR want uh, is looking for an ambassador to Germany, and the year the year is nineteen thirty three, and this is early, right? And yep. So anyone with any expertise on Germany sees the writing so clearly on the wall that he can't get anyone to be the ambassador to Germany. Like, no fucking way do I want that job. Like that one is obvious. So he is able to find he finds this like kind of third tier academic who feels very flattered to be the ambassador to Germany, but he is way over his skis 
and the book is about his daughter and she kind of falls in love with the Nazis. But the reason it was interesting was like, just as that is kind of happening, how yeah. much even at, like contemporaries at the time. So this is why I'm interested to read it. I, 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 I actually do really want to read it. I'd love your take on it if you do end up reading it. I'm not sure if it's on your... I, I, I just, I will put it on my list. Yeah, put it on your list. I think it'd be good. Cause I, the reason um, I think it, it merits a read is because I do think we have this problem in technology of what responsibility do we have for the way a technology is used, which is an open question. I'm not being, yeah. We do have that. And um, if I can talk to that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I spent a year, year and a half at the ADL battling hate, doing hate speech measurement. Oh boy. Um, and big machine learning stuff. Oh, and boy. yeah, it, it was, it was at the end of the day, I would just feel mentally dirty. Yeah. Right. Um, oh my God. Oh my God. But one of the things that we keep doing is we keep applying current measures of morality to different circumstances. Yeah. And it, the, the world is not that clear, yeah. right? And yeah, there may have been some people at IBM who knew that they were doing the wrong thing, but by and large, lots of people didn't. Yeah, interesting. Um, and one of the ways by which we've gotten to this situation that we're currently in is people can't believe that these actions are possible. Hmm. Right? Hmm. And that doesn't make those people who can't believe it bad. Right. But right now we tar everyone with a brush. Um, and that's a very dangerous thing because by the by the rules of the time, the world was very different. You yeah. can't apply today's morality to yesterday's past. Well, I've been looking to read this. So if you if you'd be willing to read it, I'd like to come back and discuss it at some point. I, I would absolutely read IBM and the Holocaust. Yeah. 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 Because I, I think it's um, I, I'm because Adam, you've not read that. I, I would assume. I mean, it, no. I should. I should take a look. That, that, that sounds great. Um, it, it's. It, I, yeah, I think it's definitely highly reviewed. I want to read it, and I want to read it because yeah. I, I think that, like, I do think that there. Are, and just got to your point. I think there's a lot of ambiguity here, and I think in general there's a lot. And I think part of, you know, we in tech sometimes want to run from that ambiguity and be like, oh, like it's not my problem at all. Um, or we want to go to the other extreme, which I think what you kind of, Scott, what you're mentioning is kind of like going and like, well, no, it's your responsibility. Like everything that happens with your technology is your responsibility. And I think the, yep. the truth is in the, the messy an- middle as it, as it the, happens. The, an- the answer, the answer is in the middle. Yeah. And it always is. Well, and do you feel that like, I mean, I think one of the things I like about reading is that appreciating the ambiguity of life, the ambiguity and complexities of life, which because you've now, you've read about so many different kinds of things. Um, Absolutely, and it's a it 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 makes you realize how messy the world is. Totally, in a very very good way. Yeah. Um, one one of the uh, von Neumann quotes is that uh, people who think math is mathematics is complicated aren't aren't aware of how complicated real life is. <laughs> <laughs> real life is a mess. Something like that. Yeah. Oh. That's awesome. Yeah, real life is like how to confront your teenager about their interest in C plus plus. That's real life, right there. <laughs> that, that, that. Yeah. Doesn't get realer than that. It doesn't right? get realer than that. It's like that's right. Um, well, this has been a great roundup. Um, Scott, I don't know if you got any other kind of closing thoughts for us, or Tom, anyone else has got any kind of books uh, they wanted to get in there? Or thoughts? If I can talk, if if you'd like me, to, I can talk to you about your hero, your hero comment and about the boy not bond book. Yeah, sure. Um, a bunch of years ago, I found myself in a situation where I was working, where I was working one-on-one with one of my heroes and he turned out to be a less than stellar human. And then I ended up working with O'Reilly who, and O'Reilly and associates on a yeah. project regarding this person. And they turned out to be equally bad. Interesting. And, um, the thing, the way I ended up reconciling it is you ask yourself the question is this person more good than bad? Yeah. And if you can reconcile that, you can end up dealing with their failings because they ultimately brought good things into the world. Um, and that was how I ended up dealing with it. Um, but like it, 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 it's, it's terrible when you end up in a, in a project where you end up hating both parties in it. <laughs> yeah. When I do think there is something innate about this desire to create heroes, I definitely feel it myself or like, I want no. von Neumann to be, you know, the, the, the you do. And well, and, and to create villains too. Yes. You know, somebody does one bad thing and that's it. They're toast. 
Yeah, and we've got to kind of resist the temptation to to, to do that um, because yep. yeah, everyone is kind of in in the messy middle. And actually, you know, we, we had, I had I don't know if you um, the happened to listen to it, but we had uh, Jasmine West, Tom West's daughter, on, which was super interesting. That was I, I've listened to most of Oxide now. Oh, that's <laughs> really, yeah, because yeah, you were one of the folks that reached and reasonably so reached out to be like, hey, what the hell happened on the metal? And like, yeah, we're kind of doing this other thing. You're like, all right, what what is this? Like, all right, but I, it was fun to see you yep. check that out. Oh yeah, I listened to the original Oxide and then and then the new stuff. The new stuff, um, yeah. The new universe. And, and you guys are doing an awesome thing. Thank you for it. Oh, you bet. No, it's fun. But I, it was really interesting to get Jessamyn on here talking about like, hey, you know, Tracy Kidder, by the way, kind of, you know, he was buds with my dad and kind of reported this angle on things. It's not like this should be taken as an unvarnished truth. This should be taken as, you know, a story. And it's got truth in it. And it's got things that have been exaggerated and so on. If you read more of Tracy Kidder's works... You, that will become very, very apparent. Yeah, I agree with that. Because you mentioned that too, that you had read, and I actually picked this up. I, I don't know if that I've looked at a book longer in the bookstore before deciding not to buy it than the book that he wrote, the, a much more recent book on tech that he wrote. And I'm like- a, a, a Truck Full of Money? A Truck Full of Money, yes. And yes. and it sounds like you, you also were kind of disappointed by that one. I, I was, I know what he was trying to do. He was trying to recreate Soul of a New Machine. Yeah. And- I bet an editor made I'm him sorry. do it. <laughs> You can't, you can't capture magic. No, you can't capture magic. You can't. And you got, no, and that, that was a, that, a, that was a mistake. He, his, I, I, he's written a lot of actually great books, but um, I, I enjoyed, I read uh, House and I think what was Men to Match My Mountains. And this is good stuff, but it's not, it, it's all out of tech, yeah, basically. It, uh, he, yeah, it's good stuff, but not, not tech. He's a great writer. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. um, Solve a New Machine was definitely magic in a bottle. Yep. Um, um, yeah. No, no, keep going. Well, I was going to say, I, I, any kind of, I, I, I get, uh, Adam doesn't just have a teenager experimenting with C++. He's got a toddler experimenting with burning the house down. When he doesn't have, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, well, I, I, but Scott, any, uh, said any, any, any closing thoughts? I mean, this is, it, it's been so great to have you on. I mean, it's such a, 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 and that, that list, boy, if anyone is, is, uh, thinking that the world is boring or that it, that list has got so much on it that I think is, uh, gives the world great texture. Um, what I did today was I added a book of the week. So there's a, there's a book featured now with a picture, with a picture. Um, and the, the title that's got one of the better titles in search of stupidity. 20 years of high-tech marketing mistakes? Not only did I, I feel like this is, apparently I've got like an inner hedge fund trader in me because not only do I know about your book of the week, I front ran everyone and bought that like two hours ago so I could pick up Excellent. the $1.96 copy because uh, that does look like, uh, yeah, you, you were speaking very high of it. It looks great. It, it, is a it is a fantastic book and there's lots of arcana in there everybody's forgotten well i also you it also uh, mentions ashton tate right it talks about yes it, yeah. yes it does and like i am now like totally after showstopper where again rosicrans effect where kind of ashton tate if i recall correctly stumbles through the back of showstopper i am now like super curious to read a book about ashton tate yes it, it's not a full book about ashton tate like it's more vignettes and, and he he goes through different eras but he definitely he definitely covers it that's awesome um yeah. That's awesome. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Ian, thank you for the, I, the, just a, a lot of great recommendations. Tom, as always, Dan, thank you for, for your thoughts and recommendations. Um, and Adam, thanks. Uh, thanks for always. This was, this was a ton of fun. Yeah. Thank you, got, so, thank I, you so I, much, guys. I really appreciate this. I, I got to be up late reading every night from now on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Right. Thanks again, Scott. Thanks. Bye.